Hello everyone and welcome back. Uh, you guys really like the interview stuff, so I figured, you know, we've had a modder, we've had a content creator. How do we step that up? Well, how about an ex-developer at Creative Assembly? Hey, Balance, how are you doing? Hey, I'm, I'm doing. <laughs> Going well, thank you. Cool, cool. So for those who might not be aware of who you are, because obviously your work was kind of like in the, like, hidden away, you wouldn't be like put into the face to be attacked by the wolves. Uh, could you explain what uh, you used to do at CA? Sure, sure. So, well, I was there for quite a long time, an eight-year tenure, basically, mm -hmm. uh, starting on Halo Wars 2 as a uh, core designer, which is basically gameplay systems. I worked on AI mm -hmm. balancing and units, mm -hmm. um, all the DLCs included. And, you know, just when Hyena started kicking off as we dropped Halo Wars 2, um, and its support, that is when I swapped to uh, Total War Warhammer 2's DLC team. Mm -hmm. And I was dived, uh, dropped right in the middle of uh, development for the Rise of the Tomb Kings DLC. And ever since, mm -hmm. uh, I was on there all the way until Immortal Empires was released in Warhammer 3. That's cool, man. Um, wow, Rise of the Tomb Kings is a very good DLC. I'm a very big fan of that one. I think a lot of the fan base harkens it as like one of the best that have been released in the series so far. And it's, it's kind of hard to kind of top something that cool because like, I mean, first off, it's Tomb Kings, right? <laughs> they had such a unique campaign compared to like literally all the other factions. And again, Tomb Kings, like, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. I, I certainly was a huge fan of it myself. I mean, obviously, some of the other DLCs were... Uh, were a personal favorite of mine. Uh, for example, um, hmm, which one? Which one? I, I like Vampire Coast. That was oh, fun. That I good. I did a lot of work on the island maps there. Hmm. Um, the that whole system is uh, basically derived from my work. Not all the maps are mine, of course. Um, but but yeah, it was it was interesting to to figure all that techy stuff out how to convert the water into those land maps. That is actually um, super cool, yeah. Yeah, then I also worked um, in a higher capacity in the Prophet and Warlock DLC. Mm -hmm. um, that's actually a thing that Rich Aldrich does in his management style, that he, he would hand out to one of the designers a temporary principal role in terms of responsibility mm -hmm. and essentially give you a level of creative control that you normally don't have. Uh, Prophet and Warlock was my time. Mm. Um, very, very proud of that. It actually ended up being one of the most popular DSC up to that point. And nukes. <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, I mean, Ikit uh, from the tabletop was always very popular. Adding in the Doom Rocket, which on the tabletop too was horrendously stupid, you know? And then <laughs> adding, seeing that come into light into Total War was interesting uh it is scary <laughs> when you it, you know. it was definitely a time for super weapons we really wanted to shift things at that time towards uh, something a bit more grand mm, that is honestly really really interesting so you've worked on quite a a lot of the favorites in the sense of dlc because that's when things started ramping up to getting to a really good level um, you could say that, but I also want to stay honest, and um, I'm also the guy behind Nakai, so there's Ooh. a bit of a balancing act here, you know? <laughs> um, we we are... <laughs> I speak in the present term, I'm not at CA anymore, but um, that team always has been adventurous and hmm. not afraid of risks and nakai was certainly one of those risks where we were all like hold on this is this could go terribly wrong unfortunately we were correct <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know there's very little time to actually develop these dlcs so um at that time we were looking at three to four months of development and you had to push out an entire product from conception to the final touches Hmm. That is not a lot, so there was not a lot of time for iteration either. Yeah, that's actually really, really curious. I mean, the Nakai thing, I think if uh, maybe a little bit more time cooking would have made it really, really cool, because like, concept-wise, it's not bad. Uh, and I know that a lot of modders have been trying to like even try to 
add in their little spice to it and it, it's still very difficult to make it an interesting faction but like it kind of makes sense for him to be like that horde style because he is the wanderer after all. well one of many considering warhammer you know all those <laughs> titles um but yeah that's actually quite interesting so um you would have worked on then how did that go near the end of warhammer 2's life cycle and going into warhammer 3 did you work on like the twist in the twilight and stuff or did you just go no, straight into no, warhammer no. 3 um when did i get off warden and the paunch i i still did a little bit of technical setup at the beginning mm. so um but then i i moved on to warhammer 3 uh, we'll get to that in a minute. Yeah. Uh, so the kind of work I, I did on the DLCs hands-on was uh, mostly quest battles, actually, and a lot of the technical stuff, like setting up the the factions, start positions, diplomacy lines, um, yeah. just these not, not that exciting stuff, honestly, but it needs to get done so that everybody can get to work. Um, I also did, like, a lot of the camera flyovers at the beginning and yeah the quest battles were my biggest item so um a, a la large majority of the warhammer 2 dlc quest battles uh mm. i worked on that's uh that's kind of cool so in in terms of start positions um how would you guys like decide then for the start positions for the characters how would you look at the map and go okay here and stuff do you just reference the lore or just go well this also looks like a cool place where he could start and stuff like it's that, a mix yeah. of both it's a yeah. mix of both. So you, you're kind of looking for uh, something that makes sense lower wise, obviously. So yeah. you're going to put Carl Franz right in the middle of the Empire, right? Mm. That makes perfect sense. But you look at someone like Marcus Wolfhart, and, you know, he's, he's a wanderer. He's going to go places. He's mm. going to want to hunt things. Mm. What better prey than the lizard men, uh, the mm. biggest beasts in the Warhammer world? So we put him right next to the lizard man and also uh the dlcs used to be these two lord packages where we would face off these two mm. so they would have to be in enough of a proximity to each other so that they could actually engage okay yeah that uh that does make a lot of sense can i ask uh maybe you can't uh, go into it why was it by any chance like why was it lizard men versus empire because like for me, that just sounded really confusing because it was order faction with an order faction. I know the lizard men don't fall into order by people's eyes, but that's how alignment <laughs> worked in Warhammer, you know? Uh, yeah, if you're really strict, you're absolutely correct. But there's a little bit of territorialness to them. Yes, that's so true. if the Empire wants to go out and do expeditions hmm. and retrieve some resources, you know, in true empirical fashion, then there's going to be resistance. Yeah. So it's it's a fairly easy one to set up in terms of concept. Mm. But most of these were um, also decided way higher up yeah. as to what the, what the package is. Mm. Uh, how it actually plays out, that's more on the design team side of things. But but what is the DLC at the highest level? What characters are included? That, that gets decided way high up. See, that's odd uh in a sense because we look at it through the you know through the glass of every dlc that's come out right there have mm -hmm. been some really cool matchups you know uh Elfarian versus grom perfect mm -hmm. uh then there is like you know the shadow and the blade uh it was odd because it was skaven versus dark elves and people were like well look another skaven dlc don't get me wrong as a skaven fan very appreciative of it but it was still like mm, felt forced you know yeah you feel the skaven have like too much content <laughs> i mean they need a little bit more let's be honest uh there are certain things that are missing which hopefully in the future you never know uh but it's more of the case of it would have been cool to see eshin now that we've like know that obviously cafe is a thing and stuff like that would have been cool to see eshin in the future with eshin versus cafe rather than Eshin versus Dark Elves. Okay, I can, I can totally see what you mean. I guess the problem from a business standpoint is that people are not necessarily going to own uh, Warhammer 2. And at that time, I don't, I don't recall uh, that we would have done any DLCs that didn't require the base faction just yet. Uh, I think so, with yeah. Wolfheart, it was... Did you require, at that time, the Empire as well? 
uh, Warhammer 1? Or was I, that completely separate already? Already, that was already separate, yeah. You, you would play the Empire yeah. in um, in the either Vortex campaign, but you could not play Immortal Empires because... Ah, that's right. You're right. Yeah. Sorry, it's been years. Uh, it was a weird system, but I mean, it made sense for the time, right? Yeah, yeah. So I, I guess complicating that too much uh, was not really on the table, mm. at least at the time. Uh, but I think it's it's a bit more easily received now that the Immortal Empires map is available to all. You can just lock one lord, specifically one faction, to the DLC. Mm. Um, and the tech is certainly there now to make it also comfortable. Whereas back then, it was very manually done mm. as to what was res restricted and what wasn't in the whole hierarchy of a faction. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that makes, uh, that makes a lot of sense. So... You moved directly into uh, Warhammer 3, so you would have worked on, yes. uh, you know, the Realm of Chaos. I know a lot of people aren't a big fan of that for obvious uh, no, reasons. No, actually. <laughs> no? Okay. No, I was uh, making a hard shift into battles Okay. Uh, for yeah. Warhammer 3. So one of the main things I was working on actually was uh, Never Shipped, um, because it actually died in the design stage. <laughs> so um, that was that was about... I, I had an interview with... Um, uh, about this before um, that we can maybe link in the description it was about multiplayer so uh, we were going to have very intricate battle multiplayer uh, with lots of social features and uh, and you know matchmaking oriented battles with server support and everything but yeah it was too much too much uh, and it was much more important to actually ship the game uh, for launch and that was difficult to do because yeah. it was on multiple platforms. Uh, that is the main reason that uh, we had to pull uh, pull the more detailed multiplayer support. Yeah. Uh, just for a disclaimer for everyone watching, uh, there are usually cases that stuff gets worked on and gets pulled because there's just either no time or they've realized that they want to do that. Uh, a perfect example is if you go into the game files, still in the game files, uh, Warhammer 1 still had... Uh, they wanted to do originally naval battles, so you can still find those the, the unit cards for the core factions, and I think also Bretonia in the game files. I don't know why CA has never removed that, but then they blame the whole <laughs> spaghetti code. It's like, well, you keep leaving shit in there, man. So uh, this stuff from way back in Empire and what whatnot. So <laughs> yeah, uh, that that stuff is around. <laughs> it's it's not the newest of engines. Mm. So uh, this uh, battle system, right? I guess this would have been because it did kind of feel like, especially with domination mode, that um, CA kind of wanted to make an esport out of this. Um, esport is <clears throat> esport is what comes after. So mm -hmm. it was about building a multiplayer community that would be able to interact with battles and become social in client. You know, with with intricate chat systems, group formations, uh, clans, so to say, uh, that were really popular back in the uh, heyday of yeah you, um, you just made me think of uh, you just made me think of Battle.net and Warcraft 3 man like <laughs> yeah I mean it was a big inspiration for sure I'm, I myself have played um, around 20,000 games of Starcraft 2 jeez <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I'm well within uh, the parameters of an audience for that but yeah um, you know it, it is expensive to do it mm. is a lot of work and only a fraction of the community would be interested in something like this. Mm. Um, so do I regret that it was cut? Yes. Do I also recognize why it was necessary? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I get it. Uh, I think, I think what, like 5% of the player base actually plays multiplayer or something like that? It's higher. <laughs> it's, it's higher. It's higher. I, I can't share the number, obviously, yeah. but uh, it's much higher. See, that was a number that was given out by, like, a multiplayer creator. Uh, it might have been just, like, a recent number, but then again, numbers have been dropping lately for obvious reasons. Uh, but, um, so, yeah, I mean, it does sound kind of interesting, and I guess that could have capitalized on a bunch of things. Like, for example, uh, Warcraft 3 refunded, kind of dying out and stuff like that, you know? Um, it could have been, like, the Total War version of Battle.net, um, yeah, it's it's a shame, but then again, I, I'll be honest with you. I don't do multiplayer combat. Uh, first up, I am hyper competitive, and that just springs out a bad side <laughs> of me. 
And the other thing is I mostly like campaign. I like doing silly shit with my armies, you know, and stuff like that. Um, Which is fine. Yeah, I like, think even you would have benefited though from improvements to the replay tools, however. That is such a good way to capture footage. Mm. So a as a creator, if you want background footage for whatever and have some of those fancy zoom-ins and, uh, you know, yeah. the, the slow-mos that... Um, I think Indie Pride is doing an excellent job of that, for example. So, yeah. Well, uh, some, a... Someone like him would have hugely benefited. I think you could have too, yeah. personally. Th there is a... Um like a community uh, community camera mod and stuff, which does it really well. Uh, but like better camera systems would have been uh, better in place. Funny enough, there is like new camera systems in place for Total War Pharaoh, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But like the camera systems there are actually quite good. So you can see that, yeah, improvements are being done. It's just not in the game that uh, the grand majority of the player base are probably interested in. You know? We'll get to like the Pharaoh yeah. stuff a little bit later. Yeah. But it's nice to see that the thought of camera improvements are coming into CA at least. Yeah, I mean, some seeds were planted there. And I'm really hoping that future Total War games will um, look back at this and take some inspiration so that at least, you know, not all of it was in vain. Mm. Uh, I Like I said, I did spend like about a year on those designs yeah. um, and all the... Uh, different areas, both in the in just the menus and actually in the game that you would uh, interact with as a multiplayer fan. But yeah, not not esports. Esports is uh, something that comes from a huge community interest. So that wasn't really the intention of myself or CA mm. at the time. Uh, it's if some multiplayer communities blow up and there's big tournaments already then the brand can go in and support that. That's yeah. esports, uh, in my view. Yeah, I mean, uh, we have pretty awesome community people who do loads of like multiplayer battles, uh, Turin, Dav, and so on. And th they keep that scene pretty much alive. Let's be honest, these yes. guys are the ones yes. that are doing tournaments, they're doing house rules, and just like what you'd expect from like one of these types of games, you know, a proper esports scene. And, like, I don't know, like, to me, not interesting to other creators, obviously, would be. And I feel like it's a bit of a shame that they have potentially lost on something. You never know in the future, because you never know. CA could easily go back to an idea and bring it forward. We've seen it with loads of loads of companies that nothing really gets deleted. It just gets put on, like, a shelf. It gathers mm -hmm. dust for a while. Um, it's just, you never know. You never know. So you did a lot of battle stuff. Uh, did you work on Immortal Empires or? Yes. <laughs> um, in terms of battles. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. So all these old factions were using Warhammer 2 stats. And that's mm -hmm. a huge problem because Warhammer 3 changed everything. Yeah. Um, especially spells. That's, that's actually a huge, huge part of uh, what had to be. Uh, redone and some of it unfortunately was missed as well so it, it was just a huge amount of manual labor mm. uh, that was required there and we went through all of these existing factions aired them up against the new ones made sure that they're ballpark fine um, and there was so much balancing work that we did as a group um, m myself as well uh, that was that was actually the majority of what I was doing other than this whole multiplayer systems business mm. So yeah, battle balancing all the way up to uh, the follow-up patches to Immortal Empires is is my other big ticket item. So that must have taken like a long time. There's a lot of factions, a lot of units, like months and months and months. <laughs> yeah, I can, I can imagine. I mean, um, whew, how many races did we have by the end of Warhammer Two? <laughs> like, there's a lot of different things involved. Uh, like you said, yeah, a lot of spells were kind of broken. A lot of spells are still kind of broken at this point. <laughs> but... <laughs> it never ends. It never ends. Balancing is just an ongoing process. Yeah. And it has I, to be that way. It, like, I've said this a lot too, because a lot of people do complain about balance, and I understand why they do that. But I've said it, it's like, look, it's Warhammer. It's like, it's, it's a total war game based on Warhammer. Warhammer has never been balanced, ever. So as a concept... The Total War game will never be 100% balanced. No. Okay, well... No, you, you got the good matchups and the bad matchups, right? Mm. In multiplayer, in campaign, doesn't matter. Both of them will have the same situation that, let's say, as 
um, Slanesh, you're not going to want to really fight against Nurgle because they're so sturdy and they don't care if you flank them. Yeah. So speaking of that, I'm assuming if you worked on uh, Immortal Empires, you must have worked a little bit, at least on the battle side for Champions of Chaos, right? Uh, actually, no, that was a completely separate entity at the time. So hmm. um, when Champions of Chaos was made, the DLC team and the main team were working simultaneously on the game. Uh, some people have rolled off by then, mm. but uh, that was actually the last time where uh, it wasn't just the DLC team doing the work. Mm. Okay. So at that time, there was an actual custodian team, as you guys like to say. Yeah, that's uh, that's something that we'll probably jump into a little bit later. But sure. uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it kind of felt like it was like in a very good spot because uh, the launch of Immortal Empires, yes, did have a little problem at the start and stuff. But uh, especially when they used the beta tag. Um, <laughs> but overall, it was quite good. I feel like everyone was really, really happy with it. I mean, it, Champions of Chaos launching at the same time was big because Warriors of Chaos were the first race pack because they were the pre-order incentive. And they came out rolling. We got a Warriors of Chaos rework. We got everyone's factions, a bunch of new star positions. Uh, just everything felt where we wanted to be as a fandom. Uh, don't know how CA felt about it, but like the fans were happy, and that was the main thing. The problem oh, we is, we wanted the Warriors of Chaos rework for so long, man. It it finally came to fruition. It was great to see. It honestly, was great to see. We wanted it for years at that time. I mean, to me, it's one of my favorites. I got a bunch of characters that I uh, loved painting the tabletop miniatures when I was a kid, and so on. And then. Seeing, uh, and this is something that I discussed with uh, Rich Aldridge when I did my interview with him a while back. Seeing the Warriors of Chaos kind of kit bashed, you know, to be Warriors of Chaos of Nurgle, Warriors of Chaos of Korn, Warriors of Chaos of Sinesh and stuff, all looking the same, but like having kind of like the same base, it was tabletop nostalgia for me and for a lot mm. of people. So a lot of people were like really happy. And I mean, me more than anyone. I finally got a Zazel. Uh, so like that was a character <laughs> that I was hoping for since the series got announced. So for me, that was like fucking perfect, you know? Um, and yeah, I mean, we, we were in a good spot. Patches were coming out quickly. And uh, you left, what, shortly after Immortal Empires or? Yeah, that's right. So there was, what, three updates in? That's when I left. Hmm. That's right. Um, in j just before September uh, last year. Okay, I mean... So September last year, uh, Immortal Empires came out August. So you wouldn't have been there for the Chaos Duels. Did you do anything on the Chaos Duels prior, or no, not not really. I I took a look at concepts. I gave some minimal feedback on it, but mm. uh, again, that was just done completely separately. Mm. Um, I was I was at the time just helping out uh, with the balancing uh, with the. With, with some map fixes here and there. So I was very much focused on the patching process at the time. But I had I stayed, I'd have been rolled back into the DLC team's pr production uh, plans and um, would have worked on quest battles, would have worked on campaign faction setups, and as well as helping the battle team on the side. That's kind of cool. So everything uh, that we're going to discuss now is basically new territory for you. Uh, what do you think about what do you think about the Chaos Tours then? Just in case, like uh... yeah, I played a, a little bit of it, uh, not not too much, but what I did play was very fun to me. So I I generally speaking just um, love their whole um, I, I love I love them artistically. So they're very pleasing to look at, in my opinion. Mm. Uh, love their animations, their new uh, spell lore, also super fun to use. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of fire, right? What can possibly go wrong? <laughs> um, and and they added so many campaign systems that are actually meaningful changes. Oh yeah, uh, to to how the game plays. So that is something that I I personally really need out of these factions to um, satisfy my own requirements. Essentially, um, to have fun, I think the factions need to have something that changes up the total war core formula mm. and. I think the Chaos Dwarfs definitely provide that with their whole cast system and uh, those offices. I uh, I was a massive fan. Like uh, I actually told this to Rich when I was in my interview with him. I played so much of that DLC that I made <laughs> myself ill 
Like one, <laughs> one day I had to stop one hour into the stream. I was like, I need a day off. And I ended up taking two days off because I'd been doing three to four videos a day. I was uh, streaming for like close to 12 hours every single day alongside that. So you can imagine I was not in the best state, but it was because I was actually having fun. This is an army that I myself uh, admire. A lot of people were hyped for the Chorfs for two reasons, right? Uh, they had an army book way back in the day, way back in the 90s. Then they had a Forge World army. And the Forge World army was uh, it's the Samacon book, right? I think I've got it here. No, that's the Monstrous Arcade. I don't know where the Tamacon book is. There's, there's a lot of Warhammer books. Um, so what happened with um, what happened with the Forge World Dwarfs is they were so expensive that most people wouldn't be able to afford them because they were a Forge World item, not a Games Workshop item. So finally being able to play with the Chorfs in an affordable level, a lot of people got hyped up for it because it was ridiculous cannons, right? All this firepower, this was your artillery faction, right? You had the dwarfs, now you had the dwarfs on steroids. So it was really, really, really cool. And a lot of love went into it, right? Like, it looks like a lot of love went into it. Yeah, and you know, all the mobile artillery stuff is especially fun with the trains and whatever. Mm. That was actually not very easy tech to set up, uh, from what I understood, so... Mm. Huge props to the team for making it happen, you know? Yeah, I remember Dev explaining it a little bit, and I'm like, nothing makes sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, yeah, as long as it works, who cares, man? You know? <laughs> but uh, Again, now they can do these mobile artillery pieces, and it doesn't necessarily require these uh, people drawing the pieces, which is great. Yeah, so actually, going from a design point of view, say other stuff that gets pulled by artillery and stuff like that, you know, just like the Dreadquake. Since they have the base code of that, can then that get reused? I would hope so. Like anything with these multiple cars essentially within, these multiple connected vehicles should now work. So you could make a centipede of trains in theory. Hmm, that's kind of cool. Honestly, I just like the idea of, because uh, obviously if it is new tech, new tech should be used when whenever possible, you know, or, well, where applicable, better yet said. Yeah, yeah. But that that's kind of cool. And yeah, the, the Chorfs were a big thing. I think the fan base did like it. They didn't like the price rise, but to be fair, even I, like I, I said it in my review, it's like, it's a fairly good price for a race pack, which is going to have a lot of mechanics, which is going to have a lot of stuff being implemented. There was a lot of bad communication with CA, and I feel like it's this isn't really a new thing. This happens a lot with CA, where unique mechanics for each legendary lord, it's like, no, that's their faction effects and lord effects. Careful on how you write these things, because then people expect unique mechanics for every single legendary lord. But, like, what, 25 euros for that? I'd say, yeah. For a race pack, pretty good. Then what happened is, and obviously we didn't go to the fact that after Immortal Empires there was a lull. The CA likes to go dark a lot. But after the Chorfs, we went into a lull again. And here we are. Um, what did you think about the whole Shadows of Change situation? Ooh, man. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's go. Well, I'm sure the viewers want to hear the juicy business, right? So yeah. let's, I, I guess, let's discuss it a little bit. Um, I obviously don't know a whole lot because when I left, this was a high concept, right? We, I knew that there was going to be the changeling. It was already going to be worked on in the background a little bit. Like the animators and the artists get a little bit ahead of things and um, get these made. And something like the changeling is actually one of my favorite concepts for strategy games. Something that can steal... Uh, the appearance and behavior of other creatures. Perfect. Love it. Um, in fact, if I get to make an RTS game in the future, I definitely want some kind of ability-stealing mechanic, mm. at the very least, even if not a straight-up changeling, you know? Mm. Uh, love that, 100%. Uh, as, as, a, as a battle guy, that is, that is my toy for sure. <laughs> mm. uh, but... I think I think we should really get into the controversy problem here 
yeah. of the pricing. And you also mentioned with Chaos Orbs that, you know, there was already the price increase and that there was only three legendary lords plus the, the, the hero. Thing, and I think a lot of people, uh, like, we wanted certain things, right? For the Chaos Dwarves, we wanted four. Uh, one name that a lot of people wanted was Shatter the Executioner. But CA came out and said, look, GW basically said, this is an AOS, AOS character. The problem is, if that is true, it's because it could be true. Yeah, GW kind of decides here. And then there's not that many characters. Um, the difference, I think, between Chaos Dwarfs and this is the expectations were higher with the Lord Pack than what we already had with the Race Pack. Because we already had uh, really good Race Packs, right? We had Tomb Kings, we had the Vampire Coast, tremendous content if it was like that or at least a little bit more which was the case for the chaos dwarves we were happy to pay a little bit more shadows of change just felt like it was pay more get less uh, if i remember correctly something like the soul grinders are also not particularly fantasy warhammer right they are in warhammer fantasy uh but gw doesn't like them in warhammer fantasy uh, uh -huh. So I know for a fact that another company, uh, which does a Warhammer Fantasy mobile game, asked to do Soul Grinders, and they were told no. Interesting. It's just I, I remember the there was some controversy, but I wasn't directly related, so I don't even know what it was exactly. But yeah. Anyways, back to the main issue of amount on, of content and uh, you know value for your money, right? Mm -hmm. uh, for a Lord Pack to charge the same as a Race Pack would have been unthinkable back when I was working at CA. Mm. Uh, there was a very clear distinction even with Chaos Dwarves. And okay, the price went up, sure, it's been years, uh, you know, since since the last equivalent pack was released. Mm -hmm. So uh, with the Warriors of Chaos update being less of a less of a direct Race Pack that was a lot of rehashes in there, mm -hmm. right? A lot of units, but they are rehashes. Let's be, let's be honest with ourselves. Whereas Chaos Dwarfs are completely new. Mm -hmm. um, what was the last one? Vampire Coast? Yes. Yeah. And, you know, this has more mechanics. So I, I'm also on the side of what you're saying that, okay, 25 euros. Fine. Makes sense. Makes sense. Uh, but there should have been a, a fourth lord, if possible. You know, mm. uh, that that is generally speaking my stance. Mm. As for the lord pack being same price and less content, fewer mechanics. Uh, I, I'm I'm not sold on this. I I think it's way too aggressive from the CA business side of thing, mm. things. Uh, and then obviously there's uh, the statement from from rob b um hmm. oh no don't, don't worry we'll, we'll get to that a little bit later I, like i feel like everyone needs to shot a tequila prior to that um <laughs> it, but um i i've got a <laughs> question regarding shadows of change so obviously there's sure. been a massive difference here between uh lord packs used to be uh one lord versus one lord and then here it's one lord versus one lord versus one lord do you think that Sep making uh, adding an extra faction into the um, into the mix hurt the Shadows of Change production. No, because the team is bigger. However, I know that the amount of content that was delivered was not scaled up, so you're not getting fifty percent more content, right? Yeah, you're. <laughs> that, that's the problem. So it's it's not the same amount of units per faction that you're getting. Yeah. I mean, and it's essentially the free lord that was released with every DLC before, mm -hmm. a, a complete free faction, such as Gorok way back in the day, yeah. for example. Um, you know, nothing too special that one, but people love it, so why oh, not? He, he's you know? fun. He is fun. Yeah. He is fun. <laughs> and he's got a, a good little spot for himself there. Mm -hmm. Anyways, uh, compare it to that plus the DLC. Uh, at the time. Yeah. Uh, that is not too dissimilar to what Shadows of Change is mm -hmm. in terms of what was delivered. So, it, no, it's not a difference. Yeah. I mean, it's 
it's one of these things where we're getting less content overall in the paid section. We're getting less FLC because this time we got Acold. Don't get me wrong, Acold, very, very fun. I think they just revealed the uh, voice actor today or something, which, you know, all props to him. He did a great job. Um, but there's usually an FLC Legendary Lord, sometimes an FLC uh, hero, like generic, and then there's something over in Total War Access. Now it's just one thing in Total War Access. It's like, well, why? I get it. They want to funnel people to their marketing stuff, which there was a little bit of a drama when Shadows of Change got announced, where a lot of people were getting emails from the hyenas email rather <laughs> than the Shadows of Change thing, um, which kind of set the community off a little bit further to the whole burn it all down to the ground situation. But we are getting less content overall. Now, we are getting cooler content in a sense by a lot bigger units, right? We got the Mutalef Vortex Beast, we got the Battle Cats. Uh, the War Drum is actually kind of cool, even though like animation wise, it's a bit fucked. Um, and what was the other thing that was kind of big for it? See, the Kislev stuff, I just don't like. I don't like the Incarnate and I don't like the the Beowulfs. They don't fit with Kislev. They've never fit with Kislev historically. Maybe the lore is changing, but it, it, it kind of pisses me off faction to faction. Have you played the DLC yet? Uh, no, I've watched a lot of the content, but uh, this one I have not played. Um, being both very busy and I'm also a little bit upset, I'll be honest. Yeah, yeah, because uh, obviously you've worked on this title, you know, this is... Yes, Yeah. yes, although I, I, I like the stuff in there hmm. from what I've seen and I am actually looking forward to play. I, at the time, hmm. I even told Rich that I think this looks really good, hmm. you know, uh, when it was revealed. But then the price tag, you know, that's uh, that does leave a bitter taste. Yeah. Um, not because I wouldn't buy something for for that amount. I just pre-ordered a game yesterday, uh, uh, the Talos Principle Two, breaking my whole set of rules about not pre-ordering things. Uh, <laughs> that is one exception I will make because Talos One is actually my uh, favorite game of all time. It's a puzzle game. Uh, you guys can check it out if you want. But anywho. Uh, Back to this, yeah, I was also going to comment on what you just said, that the units are, generally speaking, bigger. That is actually a major change to producing the DLC. It costs more time, effort, and is generally a cooler result when you, uh, when you ship monsters as opposed to just infantry. Yeah. I get that, but a lot of people were expecting very specific things, right? Like with Mother right. Ostankia, we were expecting Ungles, right? We were expecting a unique lore of magic because a lot of DLCs did introduce other laws of magic. Um, and it's one, one of the things of, it's kind of embedded into their culture. Where are the Ungols, right? Instead, we get a chaos creature because the unit card for the fucking Beowulfs even says it's a creature of chaos. It's like, yes, this is a thing from Mordheim. Like, um, doesn't fit with chaos. I, I've been very vocal about it because I absolutely hate it. I absolutely hate it. It's cool. It's an amazing model and holy shit, it looks awesome. But um, it's a Chaos Creature, and a Chaos Creature does not get redeemed. You can't purify a Chaos Creature. It yeah. goes against a lot of law. Um, however, the Vortex Beast, awesome. Uh, again, the Battle Cats, awesome. The characters introduced, very cool. Yuan Bo is pretty interesting. The fact that they had a Black Library writer do that like little ebook was impressive, honestly. like I think that took a lot of people by surprise. It took me by surprise, that's for sure. And it's like, if you, they would have just padded it out the DLC a little bit more, given mm -hmm. a little few things, people would have been happy. Yet, everyone just felt kind of betrayed. And then, obviously, now it leads on to a statement which... Why? <laughs> you know? <laughs> did you read well, the statement? I did read the statement. I've looked at the CA financials as well. Mm -hmm. There, you go to the UK company's house, you can see for yourself, it's very easy to find. And, you know, you can see all the uh, detailed reports and the sentiment from uh, the company directors. And they straight up say uh, that profits are up due to increased demand. What more is there to say? And they could have kept getting that profit up if they would have just made that DLC worth it. People are happy to pay 25 euros for a DLC. They are. 
The only thing so. is, it needs to be good value for money, right? I think so. If it's equivalent to a, uh, to a faction pack in, sorry, uh, a race pack in price, then the content needs to be considerably more than it is. Yeah, it needs to be equivalent to a race pack. Even if it's a little bit less compared to the Chaos Dwarves, it would be fine as long as it had that level of love, attention, and care. Yeah, like you say, new environments, new mm -hmm. uh, new creatures on, uh, on, on the monster side of things, some new infantry, new he heroes, generic lords, and the legendary lords. Mm -hmm. uh, did I mention the spell lords already? Probably. Uh, if not, you have now. <laughs> no? Okay. Uh, those are the main things, yeah. in my opinion. And anything beyond that is a plus. Yeah. I mean, um, I think a lot of people, myself included, were expecting... We had high expectations because of the Chaos Dwarves, right? So we were expecting Chicken House. We are expecting Hag Lords. We are expecting Lore Hags. That's just like for Kislev alone. Obviously, some Mongols are... Uh, uh, for Zinch... Kind of Zinch already ticked all the boxes... Except for we wanted a fireworm and a generic lord and hero for the melee portion of Zinch. Because, like, those were really popular on the tabletop. A lot of people might not know this if they didn't play uh, Warriors of Chaos tabletop in 8th edition and stuff. But a Chaos Warrior Lord of Zinch used to be one of the best loadouts. So a lot of people kind of wanted that in-game too. It's not always about the magic. It's about how hard you can hit with certain bits of magic, you know? Uh, to be fair, there is one more consideration for all this and why it might be the way it is. But that doesn't make the pricing fair, just to be totally clear. Uh, but you should expect more DLCs for each of the factions, even the ones that have already gotten them. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, like in Warhammer 2, you should expect uh, more stuff for Cinch and Cafe and the others. The problem is we more or less know that there is a supposed cutoff date. Because uh, there was a statement of three to four years' time. And everyone's thinking, well, we're getting DLC every four months as per the um, roadmap. That's not that much to cover everything that needs to be covered. Yeah, I, I can't really argue with that. But, you know, deadlines are mobile. They always are depending on stuff like a lot of people are kind of worried now due to the shit show let's circle hmm. back to the statement actually did that statement when you read that statement did that say did that feel to you like this was a bit of a threat because that's what the community for because it the whole such is the uh such as the cost of uh, developing or uh, in, uh, in, uh, keeping development of Warhammer 3, I'm paraphrasing a little bit here, that just felt like a very tone-deaf thing to say to the community. Um, I, I generally believe that CA has a little bit of a cultural problem when it comes to interacting with the community. And it also is present internally, uh, mm -hmm. where, where people don't necessarily show the necessary respect to customers, uh, bo both when it comes to just, you know, people on um, in online discourses. So whether that be Reddit or YouTube comments or whatever. Um, I, I don't think that CA's employees even, not just the leadership necessarily. Uh, I, I don't think people show enough respect to the customers that essentially uh, bunt their lifestyle. Yeah. I mean... You know, uh, we as game developers, we need to have a certain level of gratitude for people buying our stuff. And sure, you won't necessarily see the profit yourself as an employee, mm. but it is the reason you have a job. Mm. Uh, that is at least my take on, on this whole situation. So if there are fans that are highly passionate and, you know, ask for things and give feedback and praise the good stuff, that to me is a dream. It's a fantastic situation to be in, and it is something to... Uh, further keep going something to nourish yeah and i i don't think ca is necessarily doing that they're kind of in a territory where it's being taken for granted and when your price increases should be extremely difficult decisions and it should be almost apolog apologetic and not not with a 
gone to the heads. A little bit, a little bit. I think the success has gone to CA's heads in a way. I mean, you know, there's a significant uh, cost to the si to making the sales, and that is represented once again. If you go to their company records, you can take a look yourself how expensive it is to keep CA running. They, the, the total profit is only six million for CA. Uh, yeah, that is not a lot. Mm. But where is all the money going? We're looking at uh, nearly 115 million pounds yeah. of straight up turnover. So yeah. that money is going somewhere. And it's actually not really just employees. That is about 35 million, I believe. Mm. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of investing going on into infrastructure. Yeah. Uh, CA owns four buildings in Horsham alone. Yeah and uh, is still expanding. Uh, they've got something in North England now. I forget the exact place. They've got CA yeah. Sophia, obviously. They got a mocap studio here in England as well. And I think they're still expanding. Like, yeah. whoa, dude, slow down, slow down, you know? <laughs> There's been a radical shift on the size of CA, I think, pretty much since Warhammer came out, I think. Um, which is interesting, obviously. And a lot of that stuff um, has worried people because it's a lot of a lot of fans clock on to this, right? We see the announcements, we discuss it. And a lot of people think it's like, oh, they're flying really close to the sun here, you know? Where it's a lot of employees, only one active title at the moment. It's like, and I mean active as in like on sale and stuff like that, you know? Uh, like active live development whereas pharaoh yeah, yeah. right now isn't out yet and god knows what the hell's going to happen with hyenas we'll talk about that a little bit later um <laughs> so it's like they're getting really high up growing getting studios but warhammer's supporting it so a lot of people are like this 25 euros is supporting shit that i don't want to support essentially you know mm -hmm. yeah exactly like it is not your problem as a Warhammer player that CA has to own six plus buildings. Exactly. Uh, it could be a lot more relaxed. Uh, CA has a culture of primarily hybrid working now, mm -hmm. uh, but they could very well allow remote working. Yeah. Why? Because most of the people are from Europe. And I'm sure some people would love to go back to whatever country they originate from and live with their families. Yeah. They can't because why? Because people have to work hybrid. It's pretty much a company mandate. You are allowed to request remote working. Mm -hmm. If your circumstances are deemed worthy, then you're going to be granted that. So CA is good to their employees. Let's, let's not uh, make it sound bad, but the flexibility of remote working and the reduced infrastructure costs can't be ignored. Yeah. I mean, uh, I know that CA is like good to employees because we see it, right? Like they organize like ice cream days and this and yeah. that and that. And you know that sounds cool, right? And people seem quite happy to work at CA. Um, it's a good atmosphere. Yeah, and like like people hang out. You know, there's these beer Fridays even. Hmm. Yeah. So not just the ice cream Wednesdays. <laughs> see, that that's cool. That is honestly quite cool. I do agree that obviously having the ability to be able to work remote is uh, should be a, a thing which is quite common, especially like let's be let's be very honest. Uh, a lot of stuff in England right now is very expensive, so yeah. yeah. yeah and, and you know during the electricity crisis, mm -hmm. uh, CA helped pay towards that uh, when when we had uh, the initial COVID lockdown. So you know the, the studio has been pretty good with supporting that. They. Um, gave everybody the tech they needed, um, mm. myself included. I got some tech out of that. So, did you? Keep yeah, they're the tech? they're quite nice like that. Yeah, uh, got, got to keep it. I mean, it's been years. So, <laughs> you get like a fancy new PC. By the way, here's my one month notice. Bye. <laughs> it's actually the chair. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool though. It's still nice. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. As much as everyone's gonna try and want to see them as like the complete enemy, there is some good sides about CA, which yeah, we should be able to praise at that. You know. Um, so, we've uh, we've discussed like the whole thing with uh, the statement, which does like seem weird. The money side comes into effect now because obviously 
I want to talk about some other things. First off, I want to talk about Total War Pharaoh um, because, you know, that that's coming out soon, I think. I've not really been keeping up too much. Um, but it is the first historical game in a while, not a truth behind the myth thing. It's being helmed as a true historical, not a saga. Uh, have you seen much of Pharaoh's stuff? I, I've watched some live streams. I've watched the official material, yeah. Mm -hmm. What do you think so far? Uh, I'm thinking it's like Troy Plus. Mm -hmm. uh, basically resonating with what the community is saying. Uh, I love the ancient time period. I actually love the original Rome. That's a, a, a game that I grew, grew up on. Mm -hmm. um, I, I also love Age of Mythology. So obviously the time period hits home for me. But the battles just didn't really capture my attention too much. It's very infantry blobby. Yeah, it, it seems like that. Obviously, uh, you never know if things change by like the patch or release day and stuff like that. Sometimes they get better. Sometimes like Warhammer 3, they get worse. Um, mm. So it does happen. Um, it It's obviously built off Troy. I feel yeah. like a lot of the sentiment really hit it home when a developer on an interview said this was originally a, a Troy DLC and then we felt it warranted a bigger game. It's like, you just killed the dog before it got to leave the kennel, you know? It should not have been said that way. Yeah. it's But, it, but yeah, that was this whole concept of what if Troy and Pharaoh together make a um, history immortal empires situation, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean... It's not a bad thing. I feel like trilogying titles, if that actually happens, I very much doubt it, but you never know. But if a trilogy happens, or just like expanding it to a massive scale, rather than a standard size scale, like say, for example, Med 2 right now, if you look at Medieval 2, would be considered like a smaller Total War game, right? Mm -hmm. In terms of size. But, like, if they did, like, a medieval period covering as much of the known world of that period as possible, you know? I wouldn't be opposed to splitting it into two games or three games if it covered literally as much as possible, right? Or an empire game which covered the whole world and was fleshed out with coaches, armies, factions, all the right, right? Like, you got the whole buffet. Um, it just is... I don't know how much love there is for Egypt, right? Like, Bronze Age stuff. Uh, in terms of warfare, probably not much because it's extremely simplistic. Mm. Right? Mostly infantry and chariots and a little bit of missile. Yeah. Um, not too dissimilar from, uh, from the Bronze Age stuff seen in Troy, mm -hmm. or even the Hellenistic period that follows. Uh, not particularly complex scenarios, and that's why Rome was such a good pick, because there you have the advanced cavalry, there you have so many types of missiles, yeah. you have um, all these formations that you can use, uh, and and creatures like elephants and cavalry getting mixed in, it's so cool, Yeah, you know, uh, siege weapons, oh my goodness, so much cool stuff with the uh, scorpions, with uh, catapults and whatever. It's, I mean, then, Onagers. you know, you're looking at, like, Roman legionaries and stuff, right, in a nice formation. Oh, yeah. Like, that. that is, like, pinnacle stuff. Like, I discussed this with Cody when I did my interview, but that's that whole meme. It's like, how often do you think about the Roman Empire? And apparently, you know, like, <laughs> it is fairly common for, like, dudes, right, to think about the Roman Empire a lot. It's uh, fairly common. <laughs> so that that's why I thought it's like, really, Pharaoh, wouldn't it have been better just to do a Rome free? Especially since the Sophia team is fairly good. Like, I know a lot of people shit on Troy, but there's one thing that uh, the Sophia team did really well. This is something that I always sing their praises for. The DLCs were always bringing in fancy new mechanics to introduce new stuff, new ways to play, loads of stuff that we never even had in, like, Total War before. So the Sophia team is really, really good. I feel like if if they would have given not Troy 2, right? Like, they would have given... Rome free, medieval free, or something like that. Give them a big name. There would have been a lot more love from the community, right? 
I think there's no lack of competence there, and they absolutely deserve the best project that can be thrown at them. Mm. So, um, you know, there, there's this upcoming RPG game that will at some point happen, this action game. Yes. Uh, and I can't say anything about it, but they're doing it. Oh, no, yeah. Well, like, we, like stuff like that has been trickling into, like, the... the, the world of reddit and stuff for a while yeah and uh i'm half convinced it's a dating simulator at this point you know because ca <laughs> want to do all this weird shit now right like hyenas and so on i was like it's a dating simulator right it's just no no you'll like it you'll like it i, I will say that much hey you never know right because like at the end of the day i i don't mind ca experimenting i think that's good it's like at the end of the day variety is the spice of life you don't eat the same meal every single day and all that type of stuff but it's more of the case of like, um, why now, why not get your flagship stuff out first, get your community, your core people, the ones who are funding you, the cool stuff, right? And then start working on the other stuff on the side. Um, I haven't played too much of Pharaoh and obviously I can't give you guys a rating and so on because there is a review embargo. Whether or not I do a review is still up in the air. Because I'm one of these people who, if I'm going to do a review of something, I need to play like 100 hours plus, right? Like th that's always, every time I've done a DLC review, it's 100 hours plus. Because I need to be able to play through it fully to be able to tell you exactly how I feel. I'm not going to be like one of those reviewers who do five hours and go, yeah, that's my thoughts. I'm not IGN, right? I put effort into my reviews. Do it right, not fast. Sounds good to me. Yeah. And um, that's th a good approach to anything. Yeah. Game development too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't know how it's going to go. It's very clear, like, we've got DLC. Uh, that, like, if you pre-order, well, I think it's called, like, the Dynasty Edition, right? There's, like, three DLCs in that Dynasty Edition. And it's like, why are you getting people to pay, a, I think it's about 100 euro. I pay on euro on Steam. Uh, yeah. So I think it's about 100 euros. Why are you asking people to pay 100 euros for three DLCs, which... People don't know what that is, man. Like, it's cool to be able to buy them at a reduced price. We don't know what the final price is going to be of those DLCs. And, but we don't know what it is. There's no hints. Like, you're asking people to invest in something that they might actually not like. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I commented on my thoughts on pre-ordering before. I only do it when I know that this is, like, one of my favorite things in the world. Then I'll do it. Yeah. Uh, just to support the developer. Because, you know, they need the cash flow, obviously. Yeah. But uh, when it comes to, like, oh, there's all this hidden DLC, take our season pass pre-order. Oh, no. Mm. No, I, I, I don't think that's good practice. I, I think it leaves a bitter taste in the mouth. Yeah. Uh, it's worrying. It's a least. lottery. Yeah. It's, it's exactly that. It's a lottery, which worries me because, again, well, they have to make those DLCs. They have to. The yeah. problem is that since you don't know what those DLCs are, if they decide after the first one, it's like, no, we're going to kill this project and do the, t the future of Total War Pharaoh, um, they can just make subpar projects and say, yeah, this was what was originally planned because you don't know exactly what that is, right? That's the thing. And... Going further into that, there is also something that kind of worries me, and I want your uh, opinion as a uh, not only as a game developer, as a former uh, member of CA staff, and also as a content creator, because you do your content stuff too, which we'll talk about a little bit later so we can highlight your channel. Um, skins for Total War, skins for historical. What do you think about that? I would have loved that in Warhammer. There, there was talk of an army painter. Um, also cut a long time ago. That breaks my heart. <laughs> I know, I know that, that it does. Literally it broke <laughs> mine. <laughs> but uh, variants and, you know, recoloration. Wow, so good. Obviously, that's that's stuff belongs in Warhammer. But mm. do I endorse uh, paid skins in a premium game? Is that the question? Yeah. Because absolutely not. Yeah. No. Uh. The Warhammer stuff, anything that was a variant or um, special outside of the recoloration aspects mm. would have been something progression-driven. Mm. So I told you about the uh, 
whole enhanced multiplayer stuff earlier. Yeah. That included leveling up your factions through certain actions. Now that can be either local achievement based stuff or mission based stuff or multiplayer stuff. It doesn't really matter. Both are very trackable, although uh, the security of it is more questionable if it's local. But anyway, you accomplish certain tasks and you unlock uh, cosmetics. That was absolutely a part of that. We've technically got that. Um, the Mirrors of Madness thing introduced... Um, cause, well, not really cosmetics because they're still items. But if you played through Mirrors of Madness, you'd get to certain thresholds and you'd get new items for Daniel. That's the concept. It was just going to be presented very nicely and it was going to be done for every faction. So you would have had your... Uh, you know, your business in the main menu for your profile, uh, but it could have extended to the actual game. Call friends wearing a maid outfit and cat ears. That one. <laughs> There's some really cursed mods. Like, I've probably said this and some <laughs> modders going, that's what I'm going to do next. Um, <laughs> hey, if, if they do it, it gets featured. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, no, I mean... See, I, army paint is very different to what uh, the paint skins, especially for a historical game. You're giving me a historical character, like, say, for example, Ramses, and then if you pre-purchase this game, which, by the way, the system that's in place for this is you pre-order, you get these skins. These skins will then... Um, you can't get these skins after a week after launch. So it's FOMO. It's fear of missing out, which is a aspect that I, I absolutely despise... Not even in MMOs, but tabletop Warhammer and stuff like that. So I'm seeing that here in Total War. I'm thinking, why? Right? Yeah, limited content by time limits is uh, one of the worst things, I think. So it, sure, predatory. you will get those users short term and, you know, they'll they'll get it when, when the promotion is on right now. But mm. what about after and how do these people feel about it? Yeah. It's kind Why of... not just have a consistent reason to return mm. and um, offer these little objectives that are actually fun to do in in the form of missions yeah. that you can do on a macro level um, and essentially create a meta game for Total War. That that was um, that was the core of my work on mm. on Warhammer Three, but as I said, it's gone. See. I, I just see like the skins and stuff and I get worried for the future, right? I, I honestly do get worried um, because there's so many things that could lead and make this even worse. And then it's the case of just in general, I don't like skins. I don't like, I don't like fear of missing out, especially for a single player game. It, it's something that really rubs me the wrong way. Like I play a lot of WoW, right? It's an MMO. I play a lot of WoW. I don't like it there. I don't like... I, like, I don't like it there. It makes me feel like I have to play at a certain point when maybe I just can't, right? Maybe I'm busy with work or whatever. And a single-player game just feels sick. It feels disgusting, right? Like, I don't like it. I honestly don't like it. And it's something that I've been very vocal about since the title got announced. I really hope that the devs are listening regarding this. Obviously, they can't change. Maybe they can change it for the future. But, like... Whatever trajectory they had planned for skins, I hope it gets changed. You know, obviously as a specific pre-order reward, if then you have a lot of free content next to it, I'm totally fine with that because why not have a little benefit, right? Mm. Uh, but what I'm, what I'm not fine with is what you said, that exactly you get the whole fear of missing out situation where... You have content accessible for this and that period of time only if you do X and Y action in that time. Or you straight up do uh, your microtransactions in-game in a premium game, in a single-player game. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, hmm. please. I have to keep looking away when I'm trying. Yep, muted. There we go. See, that was uh, something I was trying to say. Because every time I want to hit the vape, because people complained... I have to mute it, but like sometimes I just have to like keep pressing it. Sometimes it's an old uh, microphone, but yeah, no, I, I totally, uh, I totally agree with you. Uh, it, it's the case also. Like, I mean, it, it doesn't fit with a historical man. Like, it doesn't, right? That's stuff that's kind of weird business that like 
Kawhi or Kyle or whatever, however you pronounce that name. They do Dynasty Warriors, right? Like, that's what they do with their romanticized Dynasty Warriors stuff where you can buy skins and stuff like that. It's like, I don't feel like I should have to dress up Ramses, right? Like, Ramses should look like Ramses, not whatever the skins are. I've actually not even seen the skins, to be honest. It's I, I, I am that much against it that I don't even want to see them because... Yeah, like, why, right? For a historical setting, it's not a true historical game. No Total War has ever been a true historical game. Because the moment you can deviate from history, it's not a true historical game. But, no, it just it doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel right. Well, it's gamified history, right? So they did the right thing for gameplay, or what they see as the right thing. Maybe mm. not everybody agrees. So that that's fine, but... I, I generally agree that vision wise it's not the right direction to take to uh to play dress up with the historical characters. But I mean maybe there's a franchise already, <laughs> Warhammer Free, <laughs> where um or any future Total War games that head out of the historical zone mm -hmm. uh that could absolutely work, I think. Um for example, I'm a huge fan of Halo. And Halo has customization at its very core. Mm -hmm. You used to unlock armor for completing achievements and you would show it off because they were hella difficult to get. Yeah. That was a special thing and it was like, oh, I did this very difficult thing, spent lots of time on it. Look at me. Yeah. I'm so shiny. For that, yeah. You, you know, it's, uh, it's the whole bragging right situation. Uh, I know a lot of um, one thing, it's like, for example, in WoW, it's done with meta achievements where if you want certain uh, mounts, you would have to grind it by doing certain things, certain ways and so on. But you'd get that mount and say, yeah, I, I, I got it because I grinded for it, you know? That's yeah. fine when it's that. But like, it's just the pre-order thing makes no sense. Now, from what I've played from Pharaoh, uh, like gameplay-wise, there is a, a lot of quality of life stuff. We've seen a lot of improvements. We've seen a lot of stuff kind of going back. Uh, like, the Sieges feel better in Pharaoh than they do in Warhammer well, 3, that's for sure. But then again, that's, that's not really uh, much of a uh, <laughs> imp uh, an improvement, you know, like, or much to, like, brag about. But, like, there's, like, the return of unit formations, you've got the give way mechanic now for troops, where they'll mm -hmm. uh, fight but keep moving backwards and stuff. And uh, that's kind of cool. That is actually kind of cool. So there are some things that I can, like, say, yeah, this is kind of cool for Pharaoh. It's for me just setting wise. It's a bit hard for me to jump into. Uh, Sophia also is always uh, the the team that ends up improving the engine in significant ways. Mm. So, for example, especially in terms of graphics, uh, they're they're kind of spearheading everything mm. um, that even Warhammer Free gets to benefit from very often. So, uh, oftentimes that that's something that can be ported with some work. Yeah. I mean, uh, one thing that I'm very... Maybe some of these mechanics as well. Yeah, yeah we, we've seen that. Like, um, the Amazons in Troy had the warband system, and that got moved over to the Warriors of Chaos, which, mm -hmm. again, very, very cool. I think when, when we had early access to the Amazons and we were doing, like, streams and stuff, uh, I was actually saying, it's like, I want this for Warriors of Chaos, because it's like, God damn, it fits so well, you know? You build your way up from Marauder all the way up to Chosen. And it worked. It worked really, really well. There's a lot of mechanics from Troy that I would love to see in freaking Warhammer, I'll be very honest. It's just done very, very well. So clearly, like, it's good to see that the teams communicate that way, or even if they don't communicate, they're just looking at it going, eh, I'll have that, you know? Still good, right? Um, we'll have to wait and see. Like, I, I've told people, like, I'm going to keep an eye on Pharaoh because at the end of the day... Sophia was shining brightest for me when they were doing DLCs. So it's like, I'm going to keep an eye. You never know, right? Um, but if we move on to another title that I think we're expecting this year, that at least they they said that it was coming out this year in a number of posts, the one that everyone is confused about, Hyenas! It's, a, it's, oh, a, man. it's an odd one, isn't it? Um I was actually scheduled to work on it after Halo Wars 2. Uh, so you... <laughs> uh, I ran to Total War. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and 
you know, I, I at the time I, I wasn't actually into Warhammer, but I very quickly got into it. It's it's um, the big monsters, right? The big fantasy world, the magic, the monsters, yeah. um, it, even the humanoids that are not human are very interesting, I think. Mm. And there's so much lore, so I really enjoyed reading up on on the lore. Every time when we had something new coming up, I would just uh, I would just tell the team I'm gone for like five days doing nothing but research. Don't bother me. <laughs> and uh, they that did is... not ask me indeed. So that is cool. That is always it's nice to hear when. Uh... Yeah when the developers get invested to the point that they're researching the stuff and so on, uh, because it shows it shows that there's a love for it. There's certain people that I talk to at CA who either played Warhammer Fantasy or still play Warhammer Fantasy or paint their models. And when you see that, it's like, that's great, you know, because these are people that you can kind of hope that they're going to try their best. Now, obviously, hmm. certain people further up the line might cause the problem, uh, but it's always good to hear when developers are invested into the point that they're just reading the silly lore, because let's be honest, it's silly, right? I think it's super fun. <laughs> oh no, it's um, fun. It's fun. When, yeah. when Warhammer Fantasy movie? I'm I'm ready. Anyway. Uh, There's a cinematic universe starting now, you know, Cavill said it himself in a uh, yeah, yep. in Instagram post. I'd love to see, uh, I mean, Cavill, if you're watching, I'd love to play a Skaven. <laughs> 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 shooting the shot, shooting the shot. You, you tried anyway <laughs> <laughs> but yeah hyenas so hyenas. um i i ran from it it rubs me completely the wrong way more so than anything else about ca i think this is uh going to be the biggest misstep ever mm -hmm. i think the team working on it are uh doing their absolute best to make a good shooter it's the direction i have a serious issue with uh the world the the feel of it, the mm. tone of it. I, the visuals are nice, but I, I, I can't stand anything about what it stands for. Are you telling me that you don't like hearing the word merch 50 million I don't times? Like, I don't like that. I don't like the whole... Uh, <laughs> the, the visual bombardment of uh, telling you to be a consumer. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people I, were worried I, about that. I don't hate capitalism, but... It disrupts me so wrong, you yeah. know? So uh, I watched a bunch of streamers play. I got a key, uh, but I was like, I've got no time, uh, so I'm not going to be able to play this. But once I'm editing and stuff, I can watch some streamers. Gameplay-wise, it does look solid. Like, gameplay-wise, it looks like... I think so. Yeah, it runs well. Uh, there's some fun mechanics involved and stuff. But it's the whole thing of consume, consume, merch, merch, Sega, Sega, Sega. It's like, hey, why... Like, this feels like someone... Like, I saw a lot of people posting on the uh, Total War Reddit and so on. And I saw a bunch of, like, fairly well-known, like, creators talking about it. And they said it felt like a parody of Borderlands. And it's like... Well, it's a dystopian future on purpose where the Earth is essentially destroyed. And you, you got these stations in space where the rich people chill out and... Uh do their consumerist lifestyle and then you as the not so fortunate person go in and take their stuff that's the high vision of of the game in an elevator pitch it just sounds odd though doesn't it right but but why why choose something like this who does this appeal to is uh really my question and that's a question that was never really answered internally while i was interacting with the console team mm. uh, the team that's working on this there the former Alien Isolation and Halo Wars 2 team. Yeah. Uh, well, whatever is left. Uh, that team has actually a very heavy bleed. A lot of people ha have left. Um, not just since Alien Isolation, but after Halo Wars 2, there was a massive exodus. And retention hasn't been great uh, during Hyenas either. So uh, a lot of tr roles have changed hands, let's just say. That's a, that's a massive shame, but it's very obvious that there's been, uh, there's a lot of fast bleeding uh, from CA. Like, it looks like as quickly as people are coming, quick, uh, people are leaving. Uh, I'm not going to name names regarding devs that have left and so on, but there are some uh, devs from Warhammer 3 who have left, right? And it's always like, but 
your face or your you, you did something fairly important you know when someone does that or like even if they were character artists and stuff right everything right these are people that you might have gotten to know through postings because a lot of people do follow devs through their art stations or their twitter and stuff like that yeah, yeah. not just to get information because obviously they wouldn't post information on their personal twitters because ndas are a thing but more of a case of these are people that you admire. Maybe that you're a young fan and you want to learn about game development. So you're following these developers to kind of get a gist of what their day-to-day -day is in a sense, right? So it's always kind of weird when um, the bleed happens in a very noticeable way, right? It's... Yeah, I mean, you know, there there's a lot of <laughs> not-so-savory situations that have happened uh yeah over over there on the console team generally speaking don't people don't resonate very well with leadership uh they don't have a good relationship with each other mm. uh sometimes leadership says stuff that just upsets people mm. uh it's it, it's not a very positive environment compared to total war yeah um i i thought the total war team was always so friendly and uh welcoming and it was more like a community, I think, mm. uh, at least in my view. But maybe I'm just, uh, I, I was just more of an outsider in the console team. I don't know. I mean, it, it could be that. You never know. Uh, I, I do speak, obviously, like people know I speak to devs and stuff like that. And it's not just like in a professional manner where we're just talking about stuff. Sometimes it's just I chat to these devs because we chat, right? It's mm. not just like the social media guys or the influencer managers. It's literal people working on DLCs where we're just talking about life in general or hey how are you doing how's your week been catch-ups right they feel when I have those conversations with those devs it feels nice I've spoken to one person at Hyenas and that's pretty much it and that dude seems pretty cool to be honest I'll tell you right like seemed like a really stand-up dude it was quite enjoyable to chat to him and get to know him it's just obviously it's not my style of game uh it's just it throws it where a lot of people are thinking and obviously it is true right money from warhammer is being funneled into hyenas because it's the only active game right now so it is happening well there's a lot of projects going on at ca at the same time so that much is obvious hyenas is the longest standing one however and like i said when did halo wars 2 stop middle of oh, sorry late 2017 that's how long it's been going yeah so that's ridiculous it's a... frankly um for a company the size of ca to invest mm -hmm. that much time into one basket yeah yikes uh that could be a very 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 bad move so regarding that a lot of people do think that it's just because like a lot of people uh uh think that the reason why hyenas is being kept alive because there's a lot of studios and a lot of people might be aware with like say for example blizzard with project titan that always kept saying oh it's coming but then never came and then was finally put to rest a few years ago a lot of people think that it might just be like someone at ca who's being stubborn going look we spent so much money on this now we might as well see it to the end what the sunk cost fallacy yeah right um well you know to get such big projects approved, you have to talk to Sega. They have to approve it. They have to vet it. Uh, somehow, uh, CA leadership must have convinced them, especially the console team's leadership, who uh, the game, the brainchild is off. Yeah. It, it came very much from up top. Um, it wasn't a pitch or anything like that. So yeah. uh, it was like, after Halo Wars 2, there was a, a period of pitches but then this came uh yeah, so yeah. It, it's a i don't know i mean I, i'm trying to think of who like who in their right mind would go yeah th this genre is dying we have to make a game on it you know like it's the polar opposite overwatch was already out yeah i'm pretty sure about that right when when was that released uh overwatch one uh was I have no idea. Um, Same. I shall I shall Google it on my phone very quickly. But but anyway, it's close, and CS:GO has been out for such a long time, and that's also kind of a a, a team-based shooter, not a hero shooter, granted. Uh, 
But yeah, 2016. Then, 2016, there you go. It's already been out way before mm -hmm. this was even an idea. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, just piling on top of that, Apex happened. Mm -hmm. How do you, uh, Fortnite happened. How do you compete with these? Exactly. Uh... And, and you're CA, you're not Blizzard. Yeah. They were smaller then. They were much, much smaller then. Much. Yeah. When I joined, there were not even 500 employees. Yeah. Now it's close to like, what, 900-ish or something? Yeah. Creeping up on that 1K mark, man. Mm -hmm. So that's that's a big change for sure. Uh, for the company to maintain even a part of its culture is already impressive. Yeah. But do you really have to push your luck trying to go into one of the heaviest markets that's where you're going to be competing against the giants of the industry as really a small player. This is uh, why I'm telling you, they, they keep it's coming It's ambition up. and it's too much. That's what I'm saying. Eventually, we're going to get a Total War dating simulator. I'm telling you. <laughs> it's happening. It's happening. Whether people want it or not, it's going to happen. Because it just makes sense. Get all the famous people from history and just like have them being able to be r romanced and stuff, right? <laughs> because... They don't need IP for that. You know, you don't need an IP license to have Julius Caesar marry, I don't know, Diao Chan from, from uh, you know, the Free Kingdom spirit and stuff like that. Well, they probably do for like the like Free Kingdom spirit, but you know what I mean. It's amazing. It, it could happen. You never know. With CA being like this, it could happen. I mean, to be honest, I think a lot of people from that team wanted another Alien Isolation game or another... Or, uh, you know what I would have personally loved? Because obviously getting the IP for the Aliens franchise, it's kind of up in the air. I would have loved a, like a horror game with the engine from Alien Isolation. Like a proper horror game, right? Mm. That would have been freaking cool, man. Because Alien Isolation came out like every CA game does at the beginning. Crap. Well, there was some looking into that engine mm. as part of Hyena's early development and, you know... Um, Obviously, the console team wants to make other games as well. Yeah. yeah. So, as, as you said, yeah, there is interest in other possible projects, which I can't comment on. They are also working on more than just Hyenas, but... Mm. Uh, yeah, so that engine is just requiring too much work. Mm. And they decided to just roll with the Unreal Engine. Yeah. Shame. Which most people do, but... Uh, I mean, that's probably a good thing for ease of use as well as just generally speaking, the ability to hire people into a role and them immediately being able to work the tools. Yeah, because like you could get uh, loads of professionals who have worked in other studios who've already yeah. familiar with it. Yeah, okay. Fair, fair. I mean, it's just a shame though, because the AI for Alien Isolation was very, very good. Let's be honest. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah. Not at the launch, but like later on when it got patched in and so on. Like, it was a really good AI. People feel anxious dealing with it, you know? And that's a great thing. Like, again, a horror game would have been fantastic. Just... Mm, I, I'd love to see something like that. I mean, I'm, I'm sure this team can pull it off, although I don't know many people that are there anymore. <laughs> I, I, I have, like, a handful of friends there, but... Yeah. Like I said, the bleeding is very serious. Yeah, it's a shame. Almost everybody that I knew there is gone. That sucks. But then again, yeah. if, if they found better jobs and so on, you know, all power to them. Because at the end of the day, that's... It is the games industry. And I mean, I'm one to talk. I left. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to talk about where you went to? Sure, sure, sure. So right now I'm working at Grimlore Games. Well, not employed. It's a funny situation. Um, I'm contracting, but now I'm making my own company through which I'll contract myself. So it... it... Complicated paperwork. Anyway, I'm working on Titan Quest 2, mm -hmm. uh, which is an ARPG game follow-up of the number one, of course. Um, it is like Diablo, but mythology, ancient Greece. Cool. That sounds fun. And uh, are you enjoying the the role? Are you how uh, like do you feel? How do you feel like basically? You know. Well, it sounds like an upgrade, but it's a completely different experience. So uh, going from senior design to lead design is like, okay, uh, forget everything you know, you're now managing a team. You need to answer to the needs of that team. You need to uh, spend a whole lot of time syncing with the other teams. Mm. And 
you do a little bit of contribution of your own, but it's really mostly making sure that the contributions of your team members is right for the game. You strike so, me so as you someone... guide them, you review them. Hmm. Sorry, what were you gonna ask? Uh, no, no, carry on, carry on. Okay. Uh, so yeah, you you review the work of your of your team members and give them pointers about what could be better. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be all top down. Hmm. So I I really like um, getting pitches from the team and uh, maybe tweaking it a little bit. And then getting it into the game, mm. uh, but I also don't haven't completely stopped my individual contributions. I'm also doing a whole lot of scheduling work. So uh, basically, when I joined, there wasn't a whole lot of uh, schedule defined. I had to do that a lot myself. So it's a little bit of production as well in there. Very interesting, very challenging mm. uh, to learn all these new skills and to find the balance between myself wanting to do design work and also uh, fulfilling all my commitments. You strike me as someone who uh, wants to be in the thick of it though, like like in there uh, doing as much as you can. Well, I think um, in my own way, I can do that right now. Hmm. So just because I'm not the one writing all the designs, uh, doesn't mean that there's no contribution. So if I don't do all that production work, hmm. we would have to hire additional producers. Yeah. Um, and I'm not doing obviously cross department stuff, but our own departments, uh, so systems design uh, specifically. And we're dealing with stuff like the uh, like the character classes. We call them masteries. Are we recording. Yeah. There we go. Sorry, we had a little bit of an issue. We're back. <laughs> Yes, yes, sorry about that, tech issues. Anyways, uh, I want to shift a bit from what we just talked about with production into what the game actually is about, just a real quick elevator pitch. Um, so yeah, it is an ARPG in the mythological Greek setting uh, with a little bit of liberty to it, but in true Titan Quest nature, you're going to have two masteries, uh, which we haven't confirmed what they are yet exactly in terms of uh, what they what they were in Titan Quest 1, though I can make a comparison. So you could pick, for example, a Warfare Mastery, a normal warrior character, and mix that with something um, elemental magic related, like Earth, that was fire and all sorts of uh, actual Earth-based skills. And you mix these two together into your class, uh, choosing after the character creation. So actually, in-game, you're choosing these and how are we different from all the other ARPG games? We are going to make this very uh, interesting in terms of the combat. It will be challenging. Uh, the creatures will pose a real threat to you mm -hmm. and have abilities that you either need to dodge or figure out some way to uh, resist with your character if you don't want to go the mobile direction. And uh, everything will be rather well telegraphed so that you can tell the creatures apart. We'll have a rich set of mythological creatures, of course, some of which we make up ourselves, uh, some of which are from classic ancient mythology, some of which are returning from Titan Quest 1. Like on the Steam page, you can see, for example, the Ictians, these fish creatures, humanoids. Uh, love so fish fan. Coming back. I love Not fish. Not a fish fan. fan. Uh, beat them up then. <laughs> <laughs> but uh... um, and, and yeah, it's an open world game as well. Oh, That's great. also uh, a little bit new there. So you'll... There's some linearity to it, but you'll also be able to explore at your own pace, farm where you want to farm, mm. and there's so much good stuff to come across uh, in the world. A little bit of secret areas, a little bit of mini bosses that you may not come across on your first playthrough. That's cool, actually. I, I, I like ARPGs. Uh, it's just a shame with what happened with um, you know Diablo. Uh, that was not great. Started yeah, off we, strong. We've, we've, we've analyzed it very closely to hopefully learn from it. Um, but we are a very different game in terms of direction. So like the main thing we have in common is the genre. <laughs> yeah, well, it's important about to look it. at your competitors, right? It's always it's important. important. Very important. Yeah. Or I else... think the biggest difference that will strike you immediately is that we have a picturesque world. So hmm. it's very idyllic Greece. That's cool. That's cool. This looks a... pretty. <laughs> it's not um, not very bloody. 
Is there a trailer out and stuff already? Or? There's a cinematic trailer, and we have some screenshots on our Steam page. And hopefully soon, we'll have a gameplay trailer as well. I can't exactly say when, but uh, soon, yeah. we're working towards it. Hmm. That's cool. Obviously, when you started talking about this, I'll have the trailer and stuff playing, because might as well showcase that stuff, right? It's always yeah, cool. it's a very fancy CGI trailer. You should. Yeah. No, that's honestly really, really cool. And not only that, but like, uh, I feel like a, a big reason why I wanted to ask you, not only because you were um, XCA, obviously working on other stuff, but you're also content creator too. So you do casting and so on, don't you? Yes. Which is a uh, form that I, I used to watch a lot of casters back in the day for like Warcraft 3. Uh, I used to watch a lot of uh, Azafin. He's quit now, unfortunately, but... Um, those stuff is always kind of cool, right? Like, you see a lot of it with, like, Total War nowadays and so on. What games do you generally cover? Uh, it's Age of Mythology for the most part and Halo Wars 2. Hmm. Um, so we've built this whole ecosystem for that um, on a website called MetaPlace. Hmm. Um, and we basically run our own little esports at home uh, business yeah, not? Yeah. with that. So, yeah, it's not particularly big. It's only started like two years ago, uh, but you know, with Age of Mythology retold coming and with us exploring Company of Heroes 3, um, which actually we just did last weekend and went pretty well. Um, we involved all the community casters and we had like nearly 700 viewers across all channels. It was okay. Nice, nice. Honestly, that's pretty cool. See, that that's always kind of cool when you see that the, um, I feel like a, a big strong thing when it comes to like developers and so on is if they're involved in the community, even if it isn't for their game, uh, it, it usually resonates more because you know that these people are involved in certain things, right? That's one thing I like about uh, certain things when like they're modders and stuff. Like there are some CA people who kind of dabble in mods, you know, mm -hmm. whether it is for Total War or not, you never know. Because yeah. a lot and of they still keep... can gain permission. Uh, I couldn't actually gain permission to do anything for Total War content wise so casting completely off the table yeah right um so uh i, I never uh, did approach that and i think it's a little too late now to join the party but um i like to watch i mean it's never too late if you want to like play warhammer 3 and do some casting you know there's people there is a community there that are always accepting for more guys because you know the more eyes and the more well the better yet said the more mouths it <laughs> pushes the community further, right? Yeah, yeah, I, I've been considering it, but uh, there's already so much. Um, it would be a very difficult move. And uh, yeah, the big thing I'm looking forward to now would be uh, definitely Age of Mythology Retold is one of the key ones. Yeah, that was uh, uh, like a, it's, a, it's supposed to be like a proper remake, right? It's a proper remake. Yeah, I made like a whole video about this and explaining it and breaking it down, uh, what, what we know so far. Uh, but the TLDR is that it's a full remake in a fork of the AOE free engine. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So it's taking a more modern uh, baseline, and it's it's not just a definitive edition as they've done with the other Age of Empires games. Yeah, which is just basically so, a new coat of paint, and that's it. It's a new coat of paint with some new graphics and basic features, but this is like the whole game ported into something else dude that sounds pretty exciting to be honest because i used to play age of Mythology way back in the day you know mm. so that actually sounds really really cool so that sounds cool um and i'm obviously looking forward to the next big rts's whatever they may be stormgate or uh some of these other up-and-coming games like tempest rising or mm. uh, homeworld free i'm really looking forward to yeah future should be bright for the strategy genre uh stormgate was the the ex blizzard devs right that's them that's yeah. them and then this there's this zero space project as well which just had its kickstarter they raised like half a million dollars wow yeah so since you've been in the rts world a lot uh there's always been rumors always been rumors about a warcraft 4 right <laughs> Now, those rumors have gotten louder now because Metzen is back as creative director. And he says, specifically says, Warcraft, not World of Warcraft. So a lot of people are thinking he's working on multiple projects. Do you think that would ever happen? 
the Warcraft team's leadership is involved with uh, Warcraft 3 Reforged. Yeah, that's They're not dead, the though. actual people working on that, but uh, I could entirely imagine that that game is uh, being reworked at its core very slowly in the background. So uh, that could be part of it. But with the Microsoft acquisition, mm -hmm. I'd also be very surprised if they didn't dig up that Warcraft license as well as StarCraft license again. God, could you imagine if we finally got that um, MMO that they wanted to do for StarCraft too? That would yeah, been, maybe. Being interesting. I mean... Um, and it seems that acquisition is going through. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, did, did you ever talk about that on your channel? Do you have any thoughts? Um, I mean, to be fair, I'm, I'm one of these people because I still play Blizzard games. I know a lot of people gave me flack for it, for saying that in the last interview. But look, I, I, I've been playing WoW since since freaking vanilla. Like... It's it's my it's it's my crack to me. Um, <laughs> there there are loads of games that a lot of people tell me to play, but I will always go back to the ones that I'm used to. Uh, like Total War, I play a lot, but WoW for me is my comfort game. WoW is I can literally sit, like log on a character, go to Nagrand, right, which is this place in Outland, and just chill there, watching the scenery for hours and be happy, right? Whilst I'm painting or writing or something. So. I've been keeping an eye on it because Blizzard has been in its worst state for the past few years than it's ever been. Obviously, we've won they've found out there's been a lot of skeletons in the closet and so on. Um, and a lot of people have been saying that Microsoft could kind of fix that problem. Maybe, maybe. Um, there's a lot of flack that Microsoft is getting as well, you know, with like uh, layoffs for increased profits and whatnot. And uh, mm. I'm particularly pretty mad at them about that because um yeah they they let go several of my of my friends so uh painful mm. and obviously what they did to halo infinite at free for free um also was something else mm. 500 million dollars i think was their budget and they completely butchered the franchise with it it's um, so a they double -edged remade sword. their engine they uh they really sold it as something that will give them more opportunities to do everything they need. But once it came to release and post-release support, it was just incredibly unimpressive. The game barely worked. Mm. And even still today, there's plenty of problems with it and barely any population. So very sad to be a, a Halo fan these days. And Microsoft have, in yeah. my opinion, lost the flagship franchise. Yeah, I, uh, I, I've been hearing the rumors uh, that um, the Microsoft stuff was also kind of... Like, they were already working with Blizzard because they knew it was already going to happen. It's just going to be delayed. Because, uh, mm. like, there's all these rumors about Classic Plus, which there was a leak recently for it. Well, a leak, you know, because, like, every time we get closer to BlizzCon, it's always, hey, look, <laughs> a leak. Hey, look, a leak. And it's like, most of these aren't believable, and they're usually not true. But this one seems really possible. And it's like, oh, I don't know if I want a Classic Plus, you know? As much as I would love it, it just kind of feels like... I mean, WoW has already been in the downturn. There's been a lot of law changes, which have been for the worse. But it's like, do you really want to diverge it and have two separate settings, which means double the potential fuck-ups, you know? Especially, like... Microsoft again being involved. I mean, there was that big leak for uh, the whole Bethesda thing with Microsoft about like an Oblivion remaster, a uh, Fallout 3 new master, uh, remaster and stuff like that. It's like, does anyone really want that? Like, I, I love Oblivion. I love it more than Skyrim, but like, I don't really want a remaster. I just want the next fucking Elder Scrolls game. Well, they show like a splash screen of the next game and that's it. Yeah, which is apparently starting pre-production now it's like mm. so by the time given given how Bethesda takes their sweet ass time on stuff I'll get it by the time I'm 40 which is fine <laughs> but so see I actually kind of like remasters if they're done well mm. so for example recently I started playing uh, the Resident Evil remasters I know I'm late those I, are I good though because they're not remasters though those, those, those <laughs> are remakes sick. those are fucking full on remakes they are really really good I mean, the horror element is there, which is mm -hmm. something that was needed. Uh, I, 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 have you never played Resident Evil prior to that? 
that's it. That's the reason I really like it so much because it was so easy for me to just jump in and enjoy a game that seems modern, but I, I, I can tell a little bit that it's inspired by, um, you know, classic noughties, uh game games. See, there's it, one it, thing. It can really be felt. The community it looks modern. It feels modern. Yes. Yeah. Exactly that. And the community keeps asking for one specific remake, and then they skipped of it to, because after Nemesis would have been Code Veronica. But they went straight to Resident Evil 4 and a lot of people are just really mad. And eventually they made a statement going, we'll get to Code Veronica eventually. Because Code Veronica was by far, at least for me and for a lot of the fan base, the best Resident Evil game. The mm. absolute best. So like a lot of people want it. And goddamn, when they skipped to 4 directly, I was like, you bastards. <laughs> uh, I know why they're probably waiting. They have to like see how they're going to do it in terms of that because it was a lot more story influence than it was gameplay but god damn i want a code veronica remix so badly like so badly i would pay i, I would pre-order that i would pre-order that i'm against pre-ordering but i would pre-order that that's the one mm. game i would that and a, a game from the 90s um future cop lapd it was so bad it was good <laughs> and like i i would pre-order a remake for that i really would but yeah, maybe just the simple remasters, not that exciting, you know? Mm. Like when they did the Skyrim Special Edition or whatever the name is. The uh, 20 editions of Skyrim, yeah. Yeah, that's not that exciting. But Full on remake, very exciting, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I, I kind of fall on that line. Because like, like you said, like the Resident Evil game's amazing. Which ones have you played so far? Uh, actually, just two. Two is good. Two is really, mm. really good. That's... Uh, it was one of my first PlayStation 1 games, Resident Evil 2. I'm just like six or seven hours in. It's not much, but it's super fun. Yeah, the, the story is great. There's uh, just like, everything was so good. God, I remember playing that on the PlayStation 1 with my father, you know, like, <laughs> oh my God. It used to have uh, four discs. It was four discs as a PlayStation wow. 1 game. Because you had uh, Leon A, um, Claire A, then Leon B, and then Claire B, and you had to play them in that order. Uh, oh my god that brings back memories it really does <laughs> oh wow yeah but such a good game seriously mm. um, huge respect for it so I want to ask a question now that like now that you're no longer at CA would you consider yourself a Total War fan this is not coming in from the perspective of a former developer but as you not Total War um, Total War Warhammer and whatever cool franchise they can throw at it, yes. If they do something like Rome, which encompasses a large portion of of the world, then I'll be probably interested, especially if it's antiquity again. Mm. Uh, would I play a med free? Yes, absolutely. And Dos Walt, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So... I don't think they can interest me in the small titles like Shogun or even Troy, even though I really love the setting of Troy and Pharaoh. It's not enough by itself. Yeah, you, you want more. Because it's really just a constrained area. Empire building, that's what I want. Yeah. In, in Total War, that's what it should be about, right? Yeah, taking uh, over as much you, as possible. Mm -hmm. And if you have this tiny map with very limited cultures i don't think that sells it to me yeah no, I as agree. the as me the player mm. yeah that's uh and, and warhammer just gives me that ultimate uh power fantasy as well as you know just the ability to enjoy all these different races which is yeah. perfect it's a strategy player's dream to me mm. uh, i haven't had as much Often experienced in RTS games, for example, where there's this many races. So, Battle Force Three did six races. Yeah. Uh, also made by Grimlord, where I now work. Uh, actually, it's the reason why I work here. Uh, hmm. I covered it a lot on my personal channel. <laughs> but anyways, hmm. uh, six races, right? Yeah. And that's already a lot of freaking content to involve in both campaign and just making the factions for uh, the combat to begin with. Yeah. But what Total War Warhammer did, it's on a different scale, and I have huge respect to everyone that contributed to that. 
Yeah. So I, I think if CA does more stuff like that and maybe ex explore different franchises or maybe make their own world, that's where Total War sells itself to me. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of races and hell, we don't even have like the true scale of the Warhammer Fantasy world. If we did mm -hmm. and we had every race, you know, we would have like double some t maybe even closer to triple <laughs> to what we already have uh which you know for me would be amazing i would love that um it doesn't seem like that would be a, a possibility though you never know in the future but um god damn man um it is one of the things i've always wanted i remember playing like rome one back in the day and i was like oh, i'd like a warhammer game and i mean we got one in the future you know fucking hell uh I've put like 2,500 hours into um, into Warhammer 3 alone. I, it would be a lot wow. more, but recently I've just not been feeling too much of a push to play it. But I was putting basically 40 hours a week into just literally Total War. And that was just playing, not just like obviously recording footage and so on, but like literally playing. Um, there's a lot of love for that game, and it does worry me where things are going. You never know. They could turn it around. They have done it before. Uh, but, yeah, I, I see it as that. Like, it's being their bigger title. It's going to be hard for them to make another thing. So I guess this kind of leads me up to the next question. If you could have the pick of the next Total War, right? I mean, barring, like, Medieval 3, that needs to happen, right? That needs to happen. Holy <laughs> shit, that needs to happen. But... Personally, for you, if you could pick a franchise, it doesn't. It can be historical, it could be uh, fictional, anything you want. What would your perfect Total War game be? Halo and space. Hey, yeah, that sounds cool. I know that CA did flirt with the idea because, like, a former member of CA staff did say that originally there was a like a flirted idea for Star Wars, which kind of sounds interesting. But, like, yeah, Halo works. Well, you never know. I don't think Halo will happen. I don't think it's got the brand presence that um, CA as a business would be interested in. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think this is a very personal answer. Hmm. It's not a commercial answer. Okay, so <laughs> what about commercial? Say say that you're ahead at CA. What would you pick next? All Total right, War, wanna... My Little Pony, right? My... <laughs> Okay, I did not expect that. <laughs> Very good, but <laughs> I would have said 40k. Yeah. Uh, but that's everybody's. Everybody knows this, right? Yeah. If you like Warhammer Fantasy, you're going to like 40k most likely. Yeah. Uh, it's a very direct transfer of the audience. It's mm -hmm. very safe. There's plenty of content to do. It's a whole galaxy to build. Mm. It needs to get done. Yeah. And you know. I think there's some others like Star Wars is interesting. Um, it should, in theory, appeal to a wider base, but it's not necessarily a direct transfer of the existing base. Yeah. So it's a bit of a gamble, in yeah. my view. And sure, you can market the hell out of that, and maybe people will play it. But there's so much Star Wars content out there. The competition is so severe. Mm -hmm. I, I watch a, a YouTube channel that does like Star Wars theories and stuff. His name is Stupendous Wave. Like I, I like his takes and so on. It's just kind of one of those things where I, I, I watch uh, once I'm painting and stuff. There's a lot of channels that I do that for. I, I don't watch Warhammer channels because obviously I do that myself. Why am I going to involve work in my personal <laughs> time? Um, mm -hmm. But uh, I think a Star Wars Total War would be kind of cool. Total War 40k kind of makes sense. I mean, there's been loads of rumors and it would be kind of cool um, just... I really hope that if those rumors are true, that Warhammer 3 doesn't suffer for it. As in, let's not get another end time situation to go into the other thing, because that's essentially what happened with Games Workshop, you know? They wanted to push mm -hmm. more focus into that. Um, I wouldn't mind it, honestly. I think that it could work. I don't know. Now that we mentioned Total War 40k, there's like five people already typing going, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. It's like, guys hypothetical please like chill but like um i think it's gonna happen i honestly do believe it's going to happen so hey if it does it does personally i would love more a total war lord of the rings i would fucking love a total war lord of the rings like literally middle earth total war. that's 
the, the, the dream. I've gotten Warhammer now. I want Lord of the Rings. I was going to ask about whether you have an opinion on that, actually. And, um, okay. My, my argument there is that it's in, in audience also close to Warhammer. Mm. Right? If you like Warhammer's fantasy world, you're probably going to like um, Lord of the Rings world, right? Mm. It's, it's a very close match. For for the person that cares about this kind of stuff, I myself do. Yeah. Uh, although I'm not as familiar with it, I I did dig a little bit into the lore of it. Mm. Uh, but yeah, obviously not as much as Warhammer because only so many hours in the day. Yeah. It's cool. <laughs> it's cool. And there's potential, and there's many factions that can be added. There's many time periods that can be covered. Mm. So if you do a trilogy, I'd actually not suggest to do the format of Warhammer 1 through 3, where everything gets combined, uh, but to feature the core races and then cover the ages. That would be kind of cool, but kind of difficult too, because like the first age is all like... The map would be different in the first age, right? Like, yes. um, because uh, Valinor... Uh, well, not even that. Everything that was Middle-earth was just huge. A lot of it got destroyed pretty much because of Morgoth and all mm -hmm. the fuckery that happened there. Um, it would be kind of cool though because then you'd get that really cool uh, Battle of the Last Alliance from like the end of the Second Age where the whole um, you know the last of the Numenorians, the Gondorians in the future essentially with the elves fighting and the end of Sauron I mean that'd be kind of cool we've all seen the films right like that was like yeah. what a way to start the trilogy this mystery of what's going on in the east yes. we have no freaking clue yeah that, that would really be cool like uh I'm a big fan of, uh, you might know that obviously Games Workshop has a Lord of the Rings license uh, for a tabletop game, right? Middle of Strategy <laughs> Battle. And they've kind of worked with the Tolkien estate a little bit to flesh out those races a little bit with uh, Rune having like this dragon emperor, uh, Japan kind of being influenced with the uh, Virgrans of uh, Kahand. Obviously then there's, um, there's a lot of like different like evil humans and stuff there's also loads of things in the north that really didn't get any attention in the books uh barring a few mentions here and there uh there was a lot in like the um the summaries at the end but it would have been cool to see a lot more and i i see a lord of the rings like total war and i think like this could make a stupid amount of money man like i would prefer it more than a like a sci-fi game or maybe mm. even like empire 2 in a sense like medieval 3 has to happen a lot of people are asking for empire 2 and i'm like, eh. like it just seems like everyone's going to be fighting using the same tech right mm. whereas like why that when you can have fucking trolls urukai orcs right uh pure cavalry rock hero armies which sound amazing right uh like oliphants to mumakyo uh all these different types of things I don't know. Like, obviously, we don't know what like the CA heads are thinking. They, they, like I said, we, we could get thrown off. My Little Pony Total War could happen, right? Um, it's one of these things that CA obviously thinking that weird stuff. But hey, only time will tell. But before anything, um, honestly, thank you so much for agreeing to this interview. I figured that people would want to hear directly from someone who worked with CA, and I feel like this would be uh, enlightening to people. Um, anything that you'd like to add in before we call it a day? I think I'm I'm happy with everything that was said. So, you know, I, I don't think we actually need to cut anything out. Yeah. <laughs> which is, which is a, a big positive every time we do one of these. So I really appreciate the opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, if I can do one shout out, it would be that um, Titan Quest 2 will come to Steam and you can wishlist it. Mm -hmm. um, it will also come to other platforms. Uh, that is Epic and Microsoft Store. Mm -hmm. So, uh, PS is it PC as well. only or? No, no, console as well. Okay. So you cool. can wish list on basically any storefront. That's cool. Um, that's a big support for us, for sure. I'll put a link to it in the uh, description in case you guys want to check it out. Obviously, you would have already seen uh, the cinematic trailer and the screenshots when we were talking about it prior. So, if it's something that you're interested in, check it out, guys. Obviously, support our good friend here he's taken a lot of time out of his day to uh 
provide some insight for us. The least we can do is throw some support to him. It was just a great conversation, I think, and I really hope that, you know, CIA comes back strong as well, because I'm obviously friendly with them. Mm. I respect their, their work a lot, and I'm personally looking forward to more Warhammer free content and whatever yeah. new Total War brings as well. Let's hope for the best. Nobody wants to see the series die. Nobody wants to no. see it die. People want it to get better because at the end of the day, we want to spend money for stuff that's worth it. But Yes. Yeah. Please figure out how. Please yeah. figure out how. That's my message to CA. <laughs> it's a good message, I think. But guys, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you all again very, very soon. Have a good day.